Hi, Terry Shanefeld here from UAB School of Medicine. In this video, I'll describe how to critically appraise a prognostic study. We'll talk about the four questions that you should try to answer while reading a prognostic study to make sure that's methodologically sound. So the three steps in critically appraising a prognostic study. One to, is to determine if the results are valid, and that will be the focus of this lecture. Two, to determine what the results are. And three, to determine if the results will help me care for my patient. Steps two and three will be dealt with in the apply module. So a very important concept that I hope you take away is that there are four things that explain all study findings of every study. They are, they are truth, chance, bias, and confounding. And your job as a reader is to determine the role of each of these in the study findings. What we're going to focus on in this lecture since we're talking about critical appraisal is bias or systematic errors that occur in the design or conduct of a study. So when you read a prognostic study, there are four questions you need to ask yourself as you read the study and determine how many of them are satisfied by the researchers. We'll look at each of these individually. So number one, was there a representative and well-defined sample of patients assembled at a common point in the course of disease? Let's look at each of these components individually. Number one, the authors need to have explicit diagnostic criteria so we know exactly what disease we're dealing with. Second, these patients in the study should be representative of the underlying population with that disease. What that means is the patients in the study should be like everybody else who has this disease. There shouldn't be something special about them. And one thing to watch out for is referral bias. And what this means is that patients are assembled in a study um, from an academic tertiary medical center. And the problem with academic tertiary medical centers is people refer very unusual, severe cases to those places. And those people are not going to be representative of everybody else with the disease. And that's okay if some of them are included um, because they are a group of the patients who have that disease, but it shouldn't be all only patients from academic centers. It should be a very broad group of patients. And finally, patients need to all start at the same point in time in their follow-up because we're trying to figure out prognosis or what happens to people. So we need to have people starting at the same point in their disease process. Ideally, it's when disease becomes clinically manifest, and we call this an inception cohort. But it could be at other points along the disease continuum, depending on the purposes of the study. So for example, it wouldn't make any sense if we're looking at five-year survival of a particular disease to enroll patients who just got diagnosed a month or two ago, along with people who have had it, say, two years. Um, it wouldn't make any sense to combine them. We'd, we need to have people starting at the same point in time. Now, often you'll see prognostic studies done in various cancers. And again, it wouldn't make sense to combine stage 1 and stage 4 cancer together. But we could have separate cohorts of stage 1 and stage 4 and see what happens to them. And everybody in the stage 1 cohort would have stage 1 and start out at a similar point. Everybody in stage 4 would have stage 4 and start out at that point. So you want to make sure, and this is a tough part to determine, is if everybody kind of started at the same point in time. Now what we're going to do through the course of this lecture um, is use this particular study um, to try to see how well you understand these concepts. And this study wanted to know the survival time after a patient is diagnosed with dementia. Very important question that lots of our um, patients have is loved ones get diagnosed with dementia and they want to know how long will they live like this. So this was a study that tried to answer that question and I have it posted on the course website if you'd rather look at it um, there instead of trying to read it in, these, in this video. But what I'd like you to do is pause the video read the snippet of the study I give you to see how well it answers the question, then restart the video and see how I answer it. So let's do that now. So let's see how you did. So this study was a population-based study, meaning it took a broad group of people from the whole population. It wasn't one small referral center. There were older patients, as you would imagine, who have dementia. And they also included pe people from institutions, because people who are in nursing homes also develop dementia. And so to see the the um, broad um, outcomes of people with dementia, they included people from the community and they included people in institutions. And this is going to be important if you think about it for our patients because they are going to have loved ones who are in nursing homes and they'll want to know their survival also. So I think this meets the um, definition of this being a representative um, sample. What about assembled at a common point in the course of disease? 
Well, what they did is they started follow-up when patients developed dementia. This is what incident means. This means new onset. So patients started being followed at, at the development of dementia. This would be a common point in the course of disease. So I think these two criteria are met. Now, in the next slide, what we're going to do is have to ask ourselves, is the de de definition of dementia reasonable? So read this small snippet, pause the video, and then come back and start it to see how I answered it. So let's see how you did. The authors used an objective, referenced method to diagnose dementia. So for me, this meets the criteria of having a well-defined um, disease. So I think our paper so far has answered question number one fine. Question number two is follow-up sufficiently long and complete. So follow-up needs to be long enough for the outcomes that we're interested in to develop. And this requires your clinical knowledge of that disease to know how long it takes for certain outcomes to develop. It would make no sense if we wanted to know five-year survival of, say, some cancer and we only did six-month follow-up. It wouldn't be long enough. So we also want to know what happened to everybody in the study. We need to keep track of every single patient enrolled in the study and know what happened to them. If we start losing patients, and the more we lose, the more and greater the threat it is to the study's validity because we just don't know what happened to those people. So let's think about why this is important. Let's consider two studies, one with a 30% outcome rate and one with a 1% outcome rate. And let's assume in both studies 5% of patients are lost to follow-up. And also let's assume that those people are lost because they all had the outcome of interest and they just never could follow up because of it. And so what I would recommend to do is do sort of worst case scenario here. Let's add back in this 5% to the outcome rate and see if it really changes our thoughts about the study. So going from 30 to 35%, you know, I'm a little worried, but it's not too worrisome. It basically keeps the answer the same. Going from 1% to 6% worries me a little bit. 1%, I'm unimpressed. 6% starting to get to be an important outcome rate. So this might be an important loss to follow up. So what we need to do and what we want to look for from the authors is they want to tell us why people were lost to follow up. We need some basic information, at least about their demographics, if hopefully to see if they were similar to the patients who stayed in the study. Unfortunately, most authors do a really bad job of telling you something about the patients who were lost. Sometimes you might get some outcomes from them, especially if the outcome is death because there are national registries for death, so it's easy to find that information. But if it's something subjective, you're likely not going to know anything about the people who were lost to follow up. And hopefully the reasons people don't follow up in the study are unrelated to the outcome. If they are related, then we really have to worry about the study. So let's see how our study did. So what I'd like you to do is look to see how long follow-up was um, and see if they give you any information about how complete it was in this snippet from the study. Pause the video, come back when you think you have your answer, and you'll see how I answered it. So let's see how you did. So the authors start, or followed people for 14 years for death after they were diagnosed with dementia. That's, to me, a reasonable amount of follow-up. Um, patients are older and following them for 14 years or so, a lot of them are going to potentially die. So uh, I think this clinically to me is a reasonable amount of follow-up. Unfortunately, you probably notice nothing in here about the completeness of follow-up. This is often very difficult to determine in a study. Um, sometimes they give you no information. You have to kind of look at figures and look at tables to see if the people that started out are still in the analysis. And when you do that in this study, you, you figure out that they actually did keep track of pretty much everybody, um, even though they don't really tell you it very explicitly. So question number three is, were objective outcome criteria applied in a blinded fashion? So there should be very specific criteria to define each of the outcomes. And this is not as important for things that are objective like death. But subjective outcomes, it's very important to have very explicit criteria so that no matter who came along, they could look at the outcomes and all agree on them. Um, individuals who determine the outcomes should not know whether the patient had a potential prognostic factor or not. Um, again, it's not quite as important when the outcome is objective like death, but if it's very subjective, the people determining those outcomes could look harder, 
trying to really find it, whereas they wouldn't do it, say, in another group if they knew the, the patient had or didn't have the prognostic factor. So you want to have very explicit criteria, and you don't want people knowing what groups anybody's in when they determine the outcomes. So let's see how our authors did. So here's a snippet of this study. I'd like you to see what the outcome criteria are and if they're applied in a blinded fashion. Pause the video. When you get your answer, restart it, and you'll see how your answer compares to mine. So let's see how you did. So mortality was the outcome. Mortality is a very objective outcome. It's pretty easy to figure out if people are dead or alive. And what they did to determine death is that, like our country, the country that this was done in, um, had a national registry. So once you die, your name gets put in this database. And the authors had it set up that they would get notified of one of their patients died. So I think this is a very objective um, outcome. Um, it would have been determined in a blinded fashion because the people in, that ran this registry would have had no idea a patient was in a study. That it had no idea they had dementia. All they know is Mr. So-and-so died. So I think this is also blinded. And finally, the fourth question that you have to ask yourself is, was there an adjustment for important prognostic factors? So when looking at outcomes um, of two or more groups, you want everything to be the same between the two groups except one variable. Um, if we're giving a patient a new drug, we want the patients who are getting the drug and then the patients who aren't getting in the controlled group to look absolutely the same except that one group got a drug and the other group didn't. We can't have multiple variables being different um, and trying to make sense of them. So we want to isolate the effect of our intervention as much as possible. Same thing here in a prognostic study. If we're looking at stage 1 and stage 4 cancer and we want to see what the survival rates are, we want everything to be the same between those two patients, their ages, their comorbidities, etc. We want everything the same other than one group has stage 1 cancer and the other group has stage 2 cancer. So you want to look to see that the authors, number one, figured out the differences between the groups, and number two, dealt with them in some way. And the most common way this will be dealt with um, in prognostic type studies is with multivariable statistical models. If this sounds like Greek to you, um, I would pause the video at this point and go look for information about what this means. I'll have another video about multivariable modeling that you could look at. There's lots of other ones out on the internet. There's lots of articles on the internet that you can look at for this. Um, but commonly this is what's going to be done. We're going to take all those factors that are different between two groups and control for them in a statistical model. So let's see what our authors did. Did they control for important prognostic factors? Here's the statistical analysis section. Look to see did they control for things and those important things that they control for requires your clinical judgment of knowing what things could impact outcomes. So pause the video look through this snippet from the paper and see if you think the authors did a good job. When you get your answer, restart the video and compare it to my answer. So let's see how you did. So the authors considered a variety of things that impacted death and think about the things that caused people to die. They control for age at the onset of dementia. It makes sense the older you are, the greater your risk of death. They control for gender, educational level, levels, marital status, social class, etc. You can see all the things they control for. And when I read a paper, I look at these things and see if they make clinical sense. Are these things that are going to be important that could impact the outcome? If the authors include some things that you're not quite sure of, then hopefully somewhere in the paper they give you a reason for why they included those things. Also, if they don't include something you would think is important, like if they left out age in this, I would be very worried that they weren't controlling for age because age is clearly a predictor of mortality. But I think the authors did a good job. They included all these things into this proportional hazards regression model. Um, so that controls for all these things that could have been different between the two groups and factors them in into giving an answer on the mortality rates after the development of dementia. So I think the authors did a good job here adjusting for that. So what's my assessment of this study? I think it's very low risk for bias. I think the population was very representative of everybody with dementia. They use an inception cohort, meaning people who were first diagnosed with dementia, that's when they started following them. Follow-up, I think, was long enough and seemed complete. Death was a very objective outcome, and they gave a reasonable way of getting information on death. And then there were differences in the groups, and they controlled for them with multivariable modeling. So I feel very comfortable at this point now going on and determining the results from this particular study and hopefully applying them to my patient. Hope this video has helped you understand how to critically appraise a prognostic study. 
remember if you have any questions you can contact me through the course website or through the contact me section of my blog. have a great day.